Well, welcome. That was wonderful. I, I, and very relevant to what I was going to be speaking on. Uh, funny thing, I was at a conference in Dallas, and I said, you know what? I need to look at my emails. <laughs> and then I saw the one from Pastor Tommy, and I was like, okay, Lord, thank you very much. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> But it's also been heavy on my heart. I'm going to tell you, when you are sitting in a room full of people and you walk up and shake hands and you are not just feeling the anointing on them, but you are feeling just a waterfall of the Spirit. Uh, it was like that. And uh, the one thing that was pretty amazing, and I texted the pastors during it, where they talked about our churches. And they talked about what was missing from them. And I said, you know, most, pe most churches don't do this, most churches don't do that. And, and <laughs> Kyle and Trisha and I were sitting there and I go, ours does. <laughs> ours does. And that was not tongue in cheek. That was said that God had led me to the right place. Right. But he did not lead me to the right place just because. Right. He led me to the right place because I prayed, I desired, I needed had to have it because even though I knew the spirit was in the church that I was there before because he answered my prayers through sermons mm -hmm. he just was in a corner sometimes not up front and center mm -hmm. and we are going into a time of, of refreshing but we're also in a time where it is prevalent both to Christians and the Jewish individuals as well messianic those who believe in, in Christ as their savior, yeah. and those also the Jewish people who are waiting on Christ to come again, Amen. even though he was there before. Yeah. So what I'm talking about tonight, it's not the mountains we climb, but it's the valleys we're living in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but first, what did God do? He led Moses to the mountain yeah. to speak to him. We're going to go to Exodus 3.15. We're going to get some prevalent information because Moses is not unlike us. Moses was not unlike Paul. Moses, uh, there's a lot of cross-referencing that goes on here. Old Testament, New Testament, a lot of alike things that go on. And especially with the meal, that room, what happened. So if we go to Exodus 3.15... God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generations to generations. Now, it took generations to generations to get him there in the first place because of what he told Abraham. How many, how many he said? He told them ahead of time. That's what's great about our father. There is nothing unplanned. From the beginning of time, he said generations and generations he came from and generations and generations to come. That's us. Yeah. That's us. Amen. Now, his words, and when he talks to them, you know, God gives Moses step-by-step -step instructions. He didn't go up there in front of Pharaoh and say, what now, Lord? I'm sorry, what, what did you say? Oh, drop, you know, the staff. He didn't say that. He told him ahead of time because Moses wasn't sure about what was going on. He is saying, God Almighty, and he's going, you want me to do what? And God is like, I'm going to tell you how to do this. I'm going to tell you to drop. Hey, look, at, let me show you. Put the staff down. And it frightens him because it turns into a snake. He just grab it by the tail. He pulls it up and he said, this is what I want you to lead by. Yeah. Very interesting. Because it was a serpent in the Garden of Eden. Grab that thing by the tail. <laughs> it does what I tell it to do. Right. It tells us. He also says, hey, this is what else I'm going to do. And this is what else I'm going to do. He also tells him, I am going to abide by my promises. 
because I promised Abraham a long time ago that these things were going to happen because I was unhappy with the Israelites. But I will pull them back out. It took a while. But he kept his promise. It's in his time. And that time is meted out in a very specific way because they had to learn these things. So we're going to go to Exodus 4. And he says, well, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And he's like, am I not here? Am I not telling you these things? Am Hello, we're having a conversation here. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the man of Egypt has to declare himself God. And then, into submission, he makes those who live under him follow that rule. But that's not our God. That is not our God. He told us from the beginning of time till now. With, at that time, it was the given word, the word expressed. The word was living, and they were living the word. Not by their choices, but they did it because they were the Israelites. They, were, they knew that they were the children. They knew that they abided by the laws of the God of, of Abraham, Isaac. They knew these things because the word was still in them. Yeah. And, they, and they had to go through that. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord says, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses did it. After, you know, he sees the snake <laughs> and he runs and that kind of frightens him. And then he puts his hand in the, in the cloak and it comes out and it's leprous. Mm. It's leprous. Mm. And he's like, okay. And what did God do? He healed it. And he takes it and he said, here you go. No, I, I, no. I'm doing this for you. If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. Yeah. But if they do not believe then, those two signs, or listen to you, then take some water from the Nile and pour it into the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become like blood. So nothing was a surprise to Moses when he got there in front of the Pharaoh. God didn't do that to him. He pulled him, he first put him in a basket on the river, had him rescued. Justin, he created him that way. He knew him that way. But he needed help from God because he couldn't do it alone. He couldn't do it. And then Moses said, uh, I can't speak very well. <laughs> I'm not eloquent. Why are you asking me to do this? Was he not once, though, the prince of Egypt? You know, wasn't he one of those in the household? Right. Yes. Didn't he, wasn't he eloquent enough to tell the slaves, build this, right. do my bidding? Uh, yeah. But to the Lord his God, now that he has been made humble as a simple shepherd, interesting, he's not eloquent. Hmm. So the Lord said to him, well, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Isn't that I, the Lord? Didn't he just heal him? Yes. Didn't he just take the snake by the tail and was given a staff? Yes. And Moses is like, can you please have somebody else do it? He's like a child. I don't want to. <laughs> well, the Lord's anger burned. God was not happy with his servant Moses. Think about it. After all, how, <laughs> how many times have we mothers said, Oh, the agony. Do you know how much I was in labor? How many hours? You know, yeah, we know because we're angry because they're not doing what we're telling them to do. <laughs> but we've done all of these things for you. you know. What did he do? What did he do? He gave him Aaron. He said, All right. I'll let Aaron speak your words, but you do the miracles. Mm -hmm. It's on you. You can't get out of this. You are that presence I chose. You are the one. It's, it's pretty interesting. Romans 13, 1 through 2. One through two. We're going to go back. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. 
So he's establishing Moses as the authority to go in there and say, let my people go. So that hasn't changed in how long? That's a lot right there. See that? See that amount of time? <laughs> but it's been established. Who established Pharaoh? Pharaoh thought he did, but God did. Who, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. That, this is why God is the same yesterday as he is today as he is tomorrow. That is relevant back to that time of Moses. That is relevant at the time of Pharaoh. Because God also told him, if he doesn't listen to you, I'm going to take his firstborn. So he gives him all of these things to do. I, I give you these. Aaron's taking your word. You've got the staff. You, you know what to do. Your hand's no longer leprous. Right. Yeah. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. What, you just told me what to do. <laughs> now he's not going to listen to me. Yeah. It's by his appointment only that these things were to come to pass. Amen. 430 years, these people have been waiting So he gets there, but who's set up really for failure here? Did he set anybody up for failure? He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Could he pray to his gods? He chooses them. He chooses who he is. Now he's the God himself, but then there's more there. You know, Ra, Isis, all of those. I didn't take time to learn. Their names are not important to me. He could have prayed to one of them. It conjured up two snakes. These people were used to seeing things of miraculous endeavors. They were used to this. This is not something new to them. They didn't go, oh my gosh, he has those powers. Where did they come from? Gods were greater. Gods were greater. So who else had their hearts hardened during this time? Because he told them to go to the Israelites, the leader of the Israelites, he told, he said, Moses, you go and you tell them these things. Yeah. And they believed him. They believed him. They knew the story of Moses, of course. I mean, it, you know, word of mouth traveled fast then, as it does today. So they, they knew these things. So they went to the Pharaoh first. The leaders of the Israelites went first. And Pharaoh called him lazy. He said, uh-uh, you're just trying to get out of your work. So guess what? Bricks, but what, without what? No, no hay, no straw, they don't get that. And what happens? Whose hearts were hardened? Wait a minute, Moses, you told us, you told us to go tell them. You told us these things. We believed you. The authority in which Moses spoke, or Aaron spoke in Moses's, had been tremendous. For them to move because they knew that the promise of God was to deliver them at one time. Yeah. They knew that. They believed that, that the God of Abraham kept his word. But now they're angry. Their hearts are a little bit hardened. Yeah. So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 3. Some of these are exactly the same thing that Pastor Tommy gave us today. Go figure that. The Holy Spirit, I'll tell you. So we're going to go to Paul. Now this is in the, the second letter to, the Corinthi uh, to Corinth, to the Corinthians there. So what did Paul do in Corinth? Those of you not in the front row. What did, what, why is Corinth so important to Paul? He actually founded the church there. He founded the church there. So it's very similar, if you think about it, in the time of, you know, after the passing of Jesus and the resurrection. Now Paul has to go back. He's founded a church. Moses was the prince. He's got to go back because he was exiled. But now he's got to go back and he's got to tell the Israelites hey, it's time, you know, we gotta, things are going to change. And the same thing with 
Paul noticed these things as well. And he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He doesn't say, by the power of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, but by the meekness and gentleness. That's just as powerful. I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you. Now, it's interesting because Moses doubted himself. There was a timidity about him. So it's a very similar thing that's happening then as happening here. But I'm bold when I'm away. We know Moses pro professed. We know he knew the God of Abraham because all of a sudden his heritage, his, who he was, was made known to him. And he had to accept it because what did he do? And where did he go? I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think we live by the standards of this world. Now, the Israelites were living by the standards of their world at that time. They had to do it with, they were in slavery, so quite a bit of timidity. They had to do it with full exception, you know, because they had no, no other course in which to go. But in Paul's time, they kind of changed the rules a little bit. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. So when going ahead and going for them, and, and Paul having to tell in a letter of, of, to Corinth saying, hey, listen, I'm going to be coming here. Please be prepared. Moses did the same thing with the leaders of the, of the Israelites. Let them know ahead of time. Let them know. We need to go in, and for three days, we need to celebrate our God. We need to do this. And Pharaoh called them lazy. And Paul is like, I, hey, you know, I don't want to be bold. And I know Moses didn't want, he knew what was coming. Yeah. He knew the people of this court. Yeah. He had love for them. Yeah, he grew up with them. Yeah. To know their firstborn was going to be taken away. Yeah. I know there's, there's, a, there's a righteous justice to it because you now he's looking at his people and they've been enslaved for 400 years, but still, yeah. he was not... He had to have been not without some compassion. But that didn't matter. He still had to stand. Just as we do today. Just as we do today. So the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. There's divine power to demolish strongholds. And certainly the Israelites had their strongholds. Yeah. You know, I'm, you've been somewhere for, you know, 400 years. You've set down some roots. <laughs> you've had no choice. Yeah. You know, where were their dead buried? Mm -hmm. That's right. did, they, did they take them with them? Yeah. They, uh, no. And we know how important generations are. Yeah. You know, so... The act of being, of restoration, leading to a harvest, Amen. That's it. back in that day, didn't come without its measure. You want to go up to that mountain? Everybody, hey, ain't no mountain high enough. Oh, you know, I want, they're tired of the valleys, you know? But it's a momentary thing because the air is thin up there. You have to dress differently. It's cold. Yeah, and there's different things up there that we don't even we, you don't even know about, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and and there's safety in numbers down in the valley. Wow, how about that? Safety in numbers. Well, and if you really think about it, most valleys are fertile. Yeah. Yeah. They're for growth. They're for rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's how you think about it. So we're going now to twelve, and here we are going to Paul. So. We're going to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Oh, I've got to get there. So 
So to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, <laughs> there was given me a thorn in my flesh. Moses's stature certainly could have been conceited mm -hmm. because he walked with knowledge in the halls that he was a prince at one time. He knew probably every foot of that city and walked it. But now I'm wondering if he didn't have some guilt, some shame, some moments when he found out he may have had one of his own beaten, his own personal, you know, intimate family members because right, right. they didn't obey. Yeah. You know, they weren't subjected to the same laws he was because they created the laws right. in which they were subject to. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. What do you think? How do you think that, you know, Satan had fun with that one? you know, whispering in his ear. So, it's a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. You know, Moses is like, please don't make me go. You know, can I have Mary? Are you sure you want me to do this? I don't speak well. My grace is sufficient for you. Am I not your Lord? Am I not your God? Did I just not heal your hand? Is, is who I am not sufficient enough for you? Right. Deal with it. Seriously, it. deal with it. Because I am with you. My power is made perfect yes. in that weakness. And so what did, what did they do? How did they endure? You know, In Exodus 11.3, you know, you find out that there are so many things the Lord made the Egyptians actually look favorably, favorably upon Moses. Um, so when God said, hey, they're going to give you silver, they're going to give you gold, and Moses says, you know, my God has commanded this, of course they hand it over. They, they actually loved Moses. Moses was highly regarded, not just by Egyptians, but by the Pharaoh's officials. God did not harden their hearts, only Pharaoh's. So, you know, the one that actually persecuted Moses was his own, <laughs> were the Jewish people. He's like, oh, like, now we have to make bricks? Now we have to do this? He goes, by the way, hello, can I get some gold and silver here, please? <laughs> And the, and, and the Egyptians say, sure, because we love him. We're not doubting his word. But those who led the Israelites did. They were angry by it. So now we're going to go to Passover. We know that the captivity was 430 years. They have been living in the valley. They have been subject to it. So there had to have been some kind of acceptance there. However, you have to wonder when they were first subjugated to the slavery. You know, there was a lot of torment. There was, you know, as anything is when you're held captive in those times. So what were their prayers like at that time to their God? How heavy was their heart? What have we done? What have we done? Oh, shoot. We did that. Well, can, can you forgive us? Well, what does that mean? There's sacrifices. There's all these things that go on with that. So they're not really, it's a little bit different than we have today. We have the love of Christ. We have salvation. Hallelujah. Second, do you think their prayers changed in the second 100 years? Do you remember us, God? Bless these children, you know. Bless this generation. Are they the ones that are going to be free? Mm -hmm. Do you hear us? Do you know that we're here? Mm -hmm. You know, third, 300. You know, the free, and by this time, you know, they're pretty much ingratiated into the culture of the time. And if you really think about it, who do you think built those idols? 
the statues. Yeah. Right. They did. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There was no crosses, well, you know, yeah. temples resurrected to, um, you know, satisfy the, the sacrifices that they had to do in order to maintain what they had to maintain in their faith. They had to build somebody else's. The altars they build, the sacrifices that they had, their people that they did, went to satiate a God that God despises. 400 years of it. What are we doing? How are we living? Who are we building our altars to? When we listen to music, we, you know those words. Some of them are just filthy. Mm-hmm. But you like the beat. You can move to it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Wait, what did that say? Oh, never mind. I like it. Or, you know what? God forgives. He'll forgive me later. Let's just stomp all over that grace. Right. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. They didn't own their own homes. You know, they didn't. They couldn't even. You know, if Pharaoh wanted, he could go right in their house. Take everything they had. Their daughters, their sons, their children, marry each other off to somebody else. They didn't have a choice. There was no consent. And if we look at the persecution of Paul and those men who built, you know, what we, you know, those things that we come to today, the churches, in that time, is it any different? Is it any more desolate than it was back then? When we listen in the pulpit and they don't even have a Bible there? The Word of God? That's why they're, that's why Pastor Tom and Pastor Lynette, that's why they're here, to give us this. And the Holy Spirit graces that information, just as it did in Acts 12 with Paul. So God tells them, you're going to do it my way. You're going to take, is it the eucalyptus? <laughs> I can never pronounce the name of that plant. And you're going to paint the top of that door with blood of a lamb. Because it's not just the firstborn, it's the animals too. So don't forget there's more to it than that. That's right. That's correct. So the blood, like the thorn of Jesus, with the blood running down. And on the side of the doors, like the pierced arms of our, our Christ. It covers it. Years later. But not the threshold. The threshold, now remember back in Egypt, they didn't have a choice. Pharaoh didn't even, those soldiers, they didn't even have to knock. They crossed their threshold. But in Paul's time, you knocked. They opened the door. Who is it? You can or cannot come in. This is a threshold. Christ had a threshold. And when he met it, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He crossed that threshold for us. And into the three days. And then he had to get those demons. He had, to, he had to take those things so we didn't have to fight them anymore. Not like they did back then. Right, 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 right. And tell them, no more. These are mine. Amen. You can't have them. That's right. Amen. And then goes to the house of the Lord. He goes to the house of the Lord. Now you've got to think back. When all of this is happening, and God says, I will pass you by. I will. I'm going to pass you by in death. But did he pass them by when they called them into the house with their prayers and their offering for the satyrs, for the meals, for those things that they had prayed? That's why the satyr meal is so important. You guys, you have to realize, because he kept saying, this has to go on. This doesn't stop. It doesn't stop modern day time. It didn't stop with Paul. It didn't stop with the disciples. It didn't stop with the early churches. Where did we forget it? Where did we say, nope, sorry, that's back then. 
Just like them churches talk about miracles. That happened back then. Well, we don't need to speak in tongues today because that happened back then. Oh, no, that was only for the Pentecost. That was only for that time. That was only for that particular measure where they had to touch those people. It doesn't happen that way. We as a race of individuals have parsed ourselves out in so many different ways of thinking and thought that there really is only one unified way of doing it. But we call ourselves different things. And God has appointed this authority over our lives. And we say, "Mm," you know, there were Israelites who did not do what they were supposed to do. And their wails of the women and the men whose firstborn were taken away that night, mixed with those who enslaved them. Just like the end times. Where one woman will be in the field, so another woman will go away. Now here, we won't, be, we won't be in a room praying and lifting ourselves up to the God who keeps his promises because we'll be gone. Hallelujah. We will not have to hear those cries. They will be wiped from our memories. Hallelujah. That's right. You know, I'm going to tell you, I heard some words a while ago, I'll bring them back, because it so happened that they were spoken by a guy in the front row here, and the one thing he said, yeah, that's you, (laughs) anytime you failed to see yourself, you've lowered yourself from what God made you. So I'm going to say it again because he always repeats himself. (laughs) Anytime you've failed to see yourself, you've lowered yourself from what God made you. What's the first thing you guys should see when you look in that mirror? Jesus. Jesus. When you fail to recognize yourself in Christ Jesus, you're crucifying him all over again, guys. All over again. He even said, you have lowered your standards. So 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 9. Got to go back to the word. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. I'm not talking about money. But even though if we take a look at what happened back all those years ago with the Israelites, he still gave them silver. He still gave them gold. Do you think that after that time, in that moment, when they said, let's go, the bonds of slavery are over. There was jubilation as they walked out, restoration. They are now Israelites. They're walking out. They're no longer slaves. Here they come. You mean all we get is bread from heaven? What is this? Water from a stone? We got all this silver and gold. What can we buy? Yeah. Clothes not wearing out sandals? Well, they were Gucci, but you know, they lasted a long time. They were bought by 430 years of blood. So the soles of their feet were red, but not by Jimmy Choo. That's not the way it happened. But it's the same. It was the same, the thorn in the side. You know, Satan pushing it. Satan, and he still doesn't give up. Because when they were gone, their Jewishness, their Israelite, their generational thoughts went with them. But what else? Yeah. 
they forgot to see what that was. Who they were. Yeah. They had been praying and praying and praying to their God, knowing who they were in slavery. But then they took it with them. You know, and the, the disciples, there were many actually disciples. You know, the, the, we have the 12 here because Christ named them so, but sure. they didn't change who they were. Mm -hmm. What they did is recognize the authority Christ gave them because they were. Right, that's right. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And they still gathered together for a dinner, didn't they? Yeah. Right. Not once, but when Christ came back, mm -hmm. they did it again. Yeah. They did it again. And it didn't stop there because he commands it. Yeah. He commands it. We are who he created us to be. Glory to God. With just an abundance of measure. What choices did the Israelites have then versus now? Look at the turmoil. People who, who don't even belong in their countries from all over the world tell them, you know what? No, this is Palestinian. You don't get a choice. That doesn't belong to you. It's the only country in the world that was named by God. We're the only country in the world whose rules were set by God. Did you know the 13 states, if you put them in on a map of Israel, is almost exactly the same? Do you think that was done by design? Yeah, holy design. And we're thinking because it's the end time, because we have things that are better than back then, or, you know, we're better people because we have more knowledge or technology. It's not. We can't even duplicate the pyramid. Mm -hmm. It is not better. We can't. Let's go to Mark 4, 15. You know, what you don't know about you is you must learn to be successful. Hmm, where did we hear that? Hmm, again, the guy in the front. So we're going to go to Mark. The one I forgot. <laughs> Pun intended. Okay, 415. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. When did that happen with them? Did it happen? <coughs> Because they knew it, you know, they could go to the leaders and they could hear it. But when did they maybe stop believing it? So many years ago. <coughs> Paul knew that he had thorns in his side. He didn't start believing it. He was annoyed by it and he prayed to God to remove it. But it didn't happen that way. How many times have we prayed out to our God and said, a little help here? You know, and then do we sit back and wait on his word? Back in 1985, I think it was. It was right after my uncle passed away. And I was, I was a performer back in Austin, and we were doing a show. And um, I was studying uh, with this woman um, who owns a, a company now. She, she uh, trains and does a lot of uh, film work now and she told me about you know how Jesus really wasn't Jesus his name is really Michael it was a lot of new age stuff and I'm like okay because I have a, a desire to learn and what are other people thinking so I went and I bought all these books I went and bought all these new age books about Buddha and about transcendental meditation and about all of these things all these different types of religion and then I took them and I put them in a stack and I gave it to God and I said Lord 
if this is my path, do you want me to learn about these things in order, you know, to either fulfill a faith in me that's not there, or to preach against a faith that's not there, or take up my sword against it? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to trust that you're going to answer. Three years went by. I still had those books. They were still sitting in my closet. Well, they were in my mother's closet. I moved them, but she still, you know, she still had them. And it's my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. And we had almost lost my grandpa. Uh, he had to go through. Uh, he actually died on the table. He had an emergency uh, quadruple bypass. And my grandfather was a very stoic man. He had booming, deep bass voice, which scared a lot of people because he was very intimidating. He was 6'4", um, and broad. You know, he was a very big man, but he was, you know, he was mushy with us because we didn't fear him. He was our grandpa. And he gets up there, and he was a man of little words. He didn't need words. He just had to look. Um, and... He said, I need to tell you something. Now, at that time, there were 65 in our immediate family. There was a lot of us. And we rented out a hall. And so we were having people come and serve us and those kind of things. And so he says, I got to tell you something. I died on the table. And I went to heaven. Now, my grandfather was not one to believe those things. And he said, I'm standing there at the gate waiting for things to happen, and I see Jesus. He said, I saw Jesus. And he goes, I'm not making this up. And if you knew him, he wasn't. And we're all like staring at him. Grandpa's talking about this. And we're like, wow. And he said, there's all of these pastel spirits. And they're like, come with us. You're an intelligent man. Come study Buddha. Come study <laughs> transcendental meditation. Every single book I had on every single thing, there was a spirit that named it. And he's like, get away from me. I don't want to study you. I don't need to study you. Get it, get it. He's like, Christ, they're not leaving. What am I doing? And Christ is just smiling at him. He's like, a little help here. He didn't get it. And he's like, ugh. And he starts, he goes, oh, yeah, rebuke. I rebuke thee in the name of Jesus. I rebuke thee in the name of Jesus. And he looks over at Christ. He goes, I had to steal a look. And Christ is smiling. And he's like, okay, I got this. But one wouldn't leave. And he kept on him and on him. And he said, that is it. I follow Christ and no other God. He is my Savior. Get out of my sight. And it left. Well, my godfather, Stephen, had a pituitary tumor. He had the first open brain operation at um, uh, the Rochester Mayo Clinic. He had pieces of his skull missing where they literally took the brain out and operated on it and put it back in. Um, so he died in 85 of a massive, massive um, body seizure. They had to break almost every bone to get him to lie straight in the coffin. What they couldn't do was remove the smile from his face. <laughs> he shone, shone with the light of Jesus yeah. even a week after he went home. He was deformed. He was shorter than he was supposed to be. Um, he was blind. So, but I always knew him. He did magic tricks. He was, he was kind of, people were amazed by him because he'd do these really... <laughs> Childish magic tricks, but he was blind, so they were like really cool. <laughs> and you know, my grandpa's up at Heaven's Gate, and he's like, "Yeah, I did it! I passed the test, all right, I get in! Yeah!" And all of a sudden, he looks, and Jesus is leaving him, and he's like, "Wait! I passed the test! I gotta go! What are you doing?" And all of a sudden, Christ comes back, and here comes Stephen, as he was supposed to be, as God intended him to be. And my grandfather wept. I have never seen that man even shed a tear and wept. By that time, we're all weeping. Even the lady bringing us her water. <laughs> oh, Lord, this is so beautiful. She, you know, I don't know if they were Christian or not. But he turned to go, 
and they saved him. They brought him back into his body. Now on the third, we, we were praying family, you know, and, and we, we weren't ready to let him go yet. Now the third time, <laughs> they, they had found a, a grapefruit size uh, tumor in his lung, and we're a praying family. And they said, you had two weeks to live. And my dad's like, are you sure? Can we go take some x-rays? And they did. And it was gone. And my grandfather turned to us. He said, all right, that's enough. Three times you prayed for me. You have miraculously, I've been miraculously healed by Christ. He said, I've gotten ready to go. See, I know what it looks like. Can you let me go? <laughs> but he answered my prayer. It took three years. Uh, some 430 years for Paul the thorns left him the day he died and he answered that prayer these were our choices we make these choices and sometimes we have to make the right choices even though they don't feel so good that we know that they're going to bring us uh, to something that is maybe confrontational. But we can only know the truth. Just like they did. Those people in that room doing exactly what they did with the unleavened bread because God told them to. He told them exactly what to eat. He told them that the man had to have a staff in his hand as he prayed. Why? Because he said so. But if we keep looking at those things, and the doors were closed 21 times, 21 times it's mentioned about doors in the Bible. It's no mistake. No mistake at all. And those people prayed. Because people they loved were crying and wailing and weeping. Either they knew the God of Abraham and chose not to listen, or because they were raised knowing that another God and another way of life. And a harvest was completed that night. The harvest of innocence. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's not easy when you lose a child. We know this. I've lost my firstborn. And the weeping of a, of a mother or a father who loses those things touches God in ways that deserve an extra helping of grace. And he does it because he can. We follow him because we can. And because we should love to. Each and every moment, no matter how hard that climb is up the mountain, it's only momentary. It's only momentary. He'll bring us back down because he wants to see how we handle it. How are you when you think that I'm not here? Because I am here. I'm watching you. I'm loving you. You don't even notice I'm carrying you. But I'm here. And he carried them out of Egypt. And now another fulfillment is happening right now. And who we are and what we are and how we love him matters to the core. It matters. Do we make a choice to play, you know, teach our children video games? Because they shut out the destroyer. We let them in by the switch of a knob, by earbuds in the ear, by the book we pick up and read. And we wonder why things 
don't happen the way we want them to. Peter, Second Peter, you know, he says, through our stripes we are healed sometimes. Uh, they're self-inflicted. But he loves us anyway, and he heals it. And he heals it. Thank you for listening.